welcome your questions in the chat. And we hope that you'll that some of this will generate some discussion here today. All right. So here we go. All right, so, so just as a short disclaimer, we can't really cover 100 years of drug policy in 60 minutes or less. And we certainly do not have the time to adequately examine the devastating impacts that white supremacy and racism that are built into the legal, medical, and treatment system have had on the Black community. So we will fall short tonight, but hopefully this will inspire some of you to do a deeper dive into the history of this issue and learn more about prevention and treatment for substance use disorder. So when we look at drug policy, our instinct is to think about the 1980s and the war on people who use drugs, but we really must go back even further. So really in 1918, we had opioids that were readily available to the public. You could walk into the drugstore and pick them up, uh, were deemed, out, deemed dangerous and outlawed. And then in 1920, we had prohibition of alcohol. And really the enforcement was focused on that area on alcohol really until about 1933. And when prohibition ends, we see a renewed focus um, in drug law enforcement. So we have the, the Bureau of Narcotics, which is formed and led by a man named Harry Ainsinger, who then serves under five presidents, Hoover, Roosevelt, Truman, Eisenhower, and Kennedy. It's a very long time. His ideas about drugs and people who use drugs were heavily influenced by his racist beliefs and his stigmatizing beliefs about people who use drugs. He refused to listen to science. He peddled false, false antidotes about the effects of drugs on a person's actions and really set the stage for a reactionary and incarceration-based approach to drug policy in America. Of course, he was not alone. There were many hands in shaping policy and response, almost all white men in power, wealthy and tainted by their own racist belief systems. If the name Anzinger rings a bell for you, you may have heard him referenced in relationship to Billie Holiday. He hated her. He hated her song, Strange Fruit, and he made it his mission to bring her down. He had her handcuffed to her hospital bed. So if that name sounds familiar to you, it might be from the movie or if you've seen any documentaries about her. Anzinger influenced many other people who took his ideas out into different communities in the United States. You may have heard of one of his former employees, Joe Arapaho, who ran prison camps in the Arizona desert and had incredibly awful things to say about the people in his care. Remember that he proudly compared his camps to concentration camps. So we have Ainzinger, who takes us through Kennedy, and then Nixon, who ushered in a new era of attack. Very important civil rights legislation was passed in 1964 and 1968. There was a growing black pride and rights movement and an anti-war, anti-establishment movement. In an interview in 1994, his advisor and his Watergate co-conspirator, John Ehrlichman said this, that the Nixon campaign in 1968 really had two enemies, the anti-war left and black people. We knew we couldn't make it illegal to be against the war or black, but by getting the public to associate the hippies with marijuana and blacks with heroin, and then criminalizing both heavily, we could disrupt those communities. We could arrest their leaders, raid their homes, break up their meetings and vilify them night after night on the evening news. Do we know we were lying about the drugs? Of course we did. So we have Nixon who really reinforces this shadow war against black folks. And then we move on to Reagan, who in the 1980s expanded penalties, established mandatory minimums and um, established the civil asset forfeiture program. We have really two major pieces of legislation during his time in 1984 and 1986. And these laws caused nonviolent drug offenders to rapidly fill up the jails and prisons and really has had a major impact on the general population's risk of developing substance use disorder. We know that disruption of family is a huge risk factor for children developing a substance use disorder in the future. And incarcerating people is traumatic and not treatment for the underlying substance use issue. We also know that these laws were enforced more in black and brown communities than in white communities. You can look at their shelf, you can look at this of yourself by looking at arrest records online and comparing them to census data. So then we move into the 90s where we have tough on crime bills. That major legislation passed in 1994 and it utilized incarceration and harsh punishments on people who use drugs, including and sort of uh, directed at younger folks. So even teenagers were now exposed to harsher penalties. The Senate draft of that bill was authored by then Senator Joe Biden and signed by Bill Clinton. Over the last 20 years, we've had a mixed bag. 
When people started dying during the opioid, the beginning of the opioid crisis, we start to see a move away from incarceration and into treatment. Of course, this is due in part to the fact that initially, white men were the greatest impacted demographic in the initial phrases of the, the opioid epidemic. So of late, there are lots of efforts to reform the criminal legal system and to offer people a chance to divert into treatment. There are growing movements to relook at sentencing and a move to think more about substance use as a public health issue and less as a criminal issue. Obviously, we have a long way to go. On the left, we see rates of drug use and sales. We know that folks use and sell drugs at similar rates, but on the right, we can see that black people are incarcerated at higher rates than white people, again, even though we know that they use and sell drugs at similar rates. So we're gonna look a little closer so we can have a better understanding of that impact by looking at this data. So this slide shows arrest rates for white people from 1980 through 2015 and encompasses two major events, the 1980s war on people who use drugs and the opioid crisis, which begins to accelerate at the end of the 1990s, early 2000s. These rates are shown as rates per 100,000. So we can see that there are increases in the arrest rates of white people in the 80s, which tops out at about 390 per 100,000. And again, during the beginning of the opioid crisis, we can see an increase which tops out around 500 per 100,000 people. Now, when we look at the arrest rates among black people, we can see that the highest rate for white people in the 35 years represented is the lowest rate for black folks, 500 per 100,000. In the 1980s, arrest rates for narcotics among narcotics arrests among Black people topped out around 1,800 per 100,000. During the first and second waves of the opioid epidemic, the highest rates were around 1,600. This is arrest data for Chesterfield. This is just looking at narcotics arrests from 2018 to 2020. And I always like to compare them to the census data, because again, we know that Black and white folks use and sell drugs at similar rates, but are certainly incarcerated at different. Now we're gonna look a little at some substance use data. So we have a fuller picture of the opioid crisis and its impacts on the community. So in the Commonwealth, we're seeing a drastic increase in death from drug poisoning. This data on the slide reflects two of the three waves of the opioid crisis. The first began with prescription drugs and it's not fully represented on the slide, and the second being the wave that we associate with heroin, which starts around 2009. And the third wave begins in 2013. We're in the third wave now, and it's driven by a synthetic opioid called fentanyl. Fentanyl is very strong, and it's really taken over the drug supply and poisoned other parts of the drug supply. So while folks might think they're buying heroin, they may often be getting fentanyl. And sometimes things like powder or crack cocaine are also cut with fentanyl. You can see that we had major death increases between 2015, 2016, and between 2019 and 2020. We're still waiting on the final data for 2021, but again, it looks like a major increase. Some positive news is that we did see less people seeking care for drug poisonings or drug overdoses in the emergency department in December, 2021 and in January, 2022. It's too soon to see if that's gonna be a trend, I think we are hopeful um, that things may be slowing down a little bit. So when we look at this, this is really just specific to Chesterfield County. The deaths that are represented here all involve substances, but they can be suicides, intentional poisonings, unintentional poisonings, and deaths that are considered undetermined. But the common denominator is they all have substances as a cause or a contributing factor. This is specific to Chesterfield, and the categories are not mutually exclusive, which means that if somebody has more than one substance in their body that causes or contributes to their death, they can be listed in more than one column, except that top column, and that's the total. So if we look at 2020, we lost 100 people. Of those 100 people, 21 were Black, which was up from the previous year's total of nine. That's a 133% increase from the previous year. Since women had no major increase in 2020 in our community, we know that the major impact was to Black men. We see that deaths with heroin present continue to decrease as we see heroin edged out of the supply, and we see that prescription drug rate deaths have had very little change. As a, as a note, I know we're here to talk about opioids, but we are seeing um, methamphetamine start to take hold and expand its reach and its impacts in our community. Although historically that has been a drug uh, most often used by white folks, uh, we are definitely seeing folks in the community um, using methamphetamine. 
So historically, opioid deaths have been most impactful to white males. But you can see that since 2015, 2016, the trajectory of death among black men has skyrocketed in Virginia. There's a, and, and really in, in the United States. There's a multitude of factors influencing this death rate, but it really all boils down to both the generational and immediate impacts of structural racism and trauma. In Richmond, the age group of black men most impacted is 45 to 54, and then 34 to 44. In Chesterfield, we have a smaller sample size, but our impacted age group seems to be running a little younger than what we're seeing in Richmond. For all people in Chesterfield, the average age of a, of a decedent, of someone who died of a drug overdose, is, is in the 37 range. But that light blue line that you see there is really on a, an incredible trajectory, and um, we should all be very, very concerned about this. This is specific just to Richmond City, and I just want to reinforce that that green uh, line is that skyrocketing rate that we're seeing for Black folks. Um, again, you can see that historically white folks have been more impacted by the opioid crisis, but really from 2018 to 2019, we started to see a major shift and an explosion of death in the black community. And while this presentation is focused on opioids, we're also seeing increases in cocaine related deaths in the black community. Of course, most often we see that both fentanyl and cocaine are present because the common, uh, it is very common for folks to use more than one substance at a time in all communities. Chesterfield and Henrico counties are also seeing increased rates of death from opioid overdoses in the black community as we already looked in that, in that uh, slide from a few uh, slides ago. And while in these counties, the rates are still higher for white people, we're still seeing a very concerning escalation in rates for black people. So it's very important that we start to talk about this as much as we possibly can. You can see that the black line is really moving in an in a incredible upward trajectory. So there's a, there's a lot of reasons that we've seen this sharp increase in the last few years. A few things are happening. We have a stronger uh, and more poisoned really drug supply. So folks may think they're buying one thing, but they're really buying something else. It's been tainted with other substances. We see more poly substance use, so using more, subs more than one substance at a time. And we have some bigger issues. Uh, you know, we're in the middle of a pandemic. Uh, we have have uh, you know, a sense of dread and despair among Americans that we really haven't seen before. Uh, folks are having a hard time, uh, you know, even working full time and affording to have housing. And we've limited access to mental and physical health care for large portions of the population. People who can't afford health care can't get it. You know, we have an economic and educational system that's not working for everyone. And in the sense, we, you know, with, we're a pandemic, an epidemic, an economic crisis, an environmental crisis. We've had political unrest. We have a, a, a trauma epidemic in our country. And we really are seeing the lasting and current impacts of structural racism. But when we look at supply issue, it really is fentanyl that is driving the death rate. It is uh, pressed into pills. So sometimes folks are buying things that they, they don't really understand are fentanyl. Um, and of course, uh, you know, as we see it seep more and more into our drug supply and we see other things phase out, we are gonna continue to see more death because of it's very strong, <clears throat> very, because it's very strong. COVID obviously had a big impact. Um, it makes it hard for folks to access recovery services. Uh, it's not the same to be online as it is to be in person. We're all uh, experiencing that right now, right? And it really did limit both bed space um, and just treatment spaces for folks. You know, the, the folks that uh, serve our communities that have treatment centers had to limit their populations in order to be safe. That made it very, very difficult for us to find um, treatment beds for folks. It's really important that we don't just think about the drugs, but we think about how did we get here? Why is it so desirable to people in the United States to take substances? Why are we more susceptible to substance use disorder than other nations? Why have drugs taken hold so successfully in the United States and really in North America? You know, what set it up to be so successful? Why were we such fertile ground? But we know that many of the reasons that we are fertile ground are structural, racism, trauma epidemic, mass incarceration and healthcare access issues really put all of us at higher risk for developing a substance use disorder. As we talk about the impacts on the black community, I just wanna clarify and stress to everyone in the room that as we talk about this, that it is not being black that increases risk. It is the system in which black people navigate in this country and in other places where they are under the stressors and impacts of systemic racism and the impacts of current and generational trauma. 
We've had inadequate investment in communities, inadequate access to mental and physical health care, inadequate educational opportunities. The list goes on and on. And even when folks are able to access these systems, the data tells us that they are experiencing impacts from racism in these spaces too. So Renee Graham wrote a short but impactful piece for the Boston Globe about the difference between blaming the community versus calling out the system that is impacting the community. Like she says, it is not exhausting to be black, it is racism that is exhausting. And while the black community has been inexhaustibly resilient, they should not have to be. So I really, I really like that quote on the right. And I did kind of, I think the whole thing is worth reading. So I'm gonna sit for a minute and let folks kind of take a second to, to read the, the words in orange. Um, actually, I will read them. So for 400 years, we have not succumbed to despair. Black people have faced every hurdle, every obstacle, and America keeps concocting new ways to get in our way. But we march as we mourn. We organize as we agonize. We fight for a democracy never meant for us. We look back to our ancestors to carry forward. We sift miracles from ashes. When white people lament to me how hard it must be to be black, how tiring it must be, I politely but firmly correct them. Racism is exhausting. White silence is exhausting. And that will only change when they step up as black people have done inexhaustibly and make this nation take its knee off our necks so we can finally breathe. So I just wanna make sure that as we talk about the effects of the opioid crisis on the black community that we really separate the community from the system which is impacting them. <clears throat> so you may have heard of food deserts, which is a lack of access to grocery stores in black communities and other um, communities of color, but there are also treatment deserts and that is one of the big impacts of uh, racism on access to treatment and recovery. It can be hard to find care in your neighborhood or your community. We also know that enforcement of drug laws do fall disproportionately on black communities and other communities of color. And generally, people who are incarcerated do not have access to consistent quality evidence-based treatment resources. There are also disparities in care in the community. Black people are 35% less likely to be offered Suboxone, which is a very effective medicine used to treat opioid use disorder. They're less likely to be connected to a clinician who looks like them, less likely to be included in research studies, which makes it hard to understand if we're providing culturally competent care and are underrepresented in recovery spaces such as recovery homes and mutual aid meetings like NA and AA. In addition, those who do make it into care are likely to experience micro and macro aggressions from the system and its providers and to not receive culturally competent care. I've got a few things on that slide that sort of talk about all the different effects that we have uh, happening to the black community. I'll, I'll, uh, I'll leave it up just for a minute because I know it's kind of a lot. There are many effective treatments for opioid use disorder. <clears throat> the gold standard of treatment for opioid use disorder are medications that are used as part of a treatment plan. When I say uh, that the best treatment for an opioid addiction is an opioid, that can be really hard for people to understand. But these treatments are tailored to work on the brain in a different way than substances like heroin or fentanyl. And these medications are really the gold standard of care. And if we could help more people access these medications and break down the barriers and stigma associated with them, we would see impacts very, very quickly. We know that these medications can cut mortality rates in half. That's substantial. Unfortunately, there's a lot of stigma and misunderstanding about these medications in the community, and people are often discouraged from utilizing them by family, friends, and even treatment providers who are not giving evidence-based advice. The stigma around these medications impacts the death rate. So if you have questions about these medications, please don't hesitate to reach out to myself or someone, uh, you know, someone in your community that you know is a subject matter expert. I'd be happy to send you some great resources on these medications and help answer your questions. And if I can't, I'll find someone who can. We know that medication alone is not the answer, that folks do best when they have a lot of things to choose from. We know that inpatient and outpatient therapy can be very helpful. Uh, we know that connecting to the recovery community and being plugged into the community can be very, very um, successful for folks. And of course, here at Chester County Mental Health, we have substance use disorder treatment team for adults and for children as well. So we have a, a same day access line. People would just call that line and that's how you get the process started if you're looking for help for yourself or for um, your child. Another tool in the fight in the opioid crisis is a medication called Narcan. It's available to everybody in Virginia. 
and is free through the health department and through the community service boards. That's the mental health support services folks, that's us. <clears throat> this is a life-saving medication. And if you know someone who is using opioids, you should consider adding this to your first aid kit. If you have curious toddlers or teenagers, you should consider having this in your first aid kit if there's opioids in the house. Or if you suspect your teen may be using or experimenting with drugs, I would absolutely encourage you to please get this into your medicine cabinet or get it into your purse so that you have it if you need it. I've, I'm, I placed some information here on the slide, but I'm also, uh, when it's um, Valerie's turn to, to uh, roll through the slides, I'm gonna put some information in the chat on how you can be trained on the use of Narcan and how you can obtain Narcan for yourself and some, um, some other information there. So look for that shortly. So as I wrap up my section here, I just wanna say that um, there's a study that became uh, quite famous and led to a lot of myths about drug use. And essentially what the experimenters did was they put a rat in a cage and gave it unlimited access to two types of water, cocaine water and regular water. The rat was alone in the cage. And 100% of the rats hit that cocaine lever until they died, 100% overdose death from those rats. And people said, aha, Look at this, drugs are so powerful, people can't stop themselves. And once they take hold, they'll just drug themselves to death. But the study is flawed because in repeats of the study, rats were given choices, food and treats, tunnels to explore, recreational opportunities, company, and they chose them. Even when the cocaine water and the regular water was there, they went from 100% overdose to basically zero. Dr. Carl Hart talks about in the absence of, right? In the absence of something better in the absence of better options, right? What if addiction is about your cage that you're in? What if addiction is an adaptation to your environment? Studies show us that when we can provide a better option, people will choose it. Connection to community and people who provide non-judgmental care and love to people who use drugs is the most effective treatment for substance use, full stop, right? We know pain, punishment, and shame only make substance use disorder worse. It does not help. And it's not just about helping people be connected, reconnected to their communities and reconnected to treatment and recovery. It's also purpose. So when you think about people who use drugs and how you can help, remember that we want to point people towards evidence-based treatment. We want to help them connect to their community. We want to help them connect to people who care for them. We want to help connect them to having some purpose. And that is how we move people from addiction to recovery. So we really must stop singing war songs about people who use drugs and move to compassion and connection. So I'm gonna turn this over to Valerie, uh, folks from our prevention team. And so I am gonna focus on risks and protective factors um, as it relates to the opioid uh, crisis that are, we are faced today. Uh, so before we get into the risks and protect protective factors, I want to just focus on the next slide, which is the three rims of ACEs and how it all plays a part in the whole big picture of addiction and opioid crisis, right? So as you're looking on the slide, you see that there are three rims of ACEs, right? And ACEs are average childhood experiences. And ACE statistics will, will say that 61% of adults have at least one ACE, right? That means one ever childhood experience in their lifetime. Whereas 16% of adults have had at least four more types of ACEs. So this is a pretty uh, accurate um, description of ACEs. Like in the household, as you see, number one, by the tree, there are all types of ACEs listed here. And not to name all of them, you know, I'll just highlight a few. There's homelessness, there's divorce, you know, there is incarcerated family member there's bullying, there's domestic violence. So there's all types of parental mental illnesses that's, you know, that's really um, is a stigma in our community, right? So there are all types of adverse childhood experiences that many of us don't talk about, but has an impactful um, overview as it relates to addiction, right? Whether or not it's opioid or um, or alcohol or whatever type of substance, it all, you know, plays a part of that. So as it relates to number two, you guys see on the screen, there's community, right? So then there's the ACEs and then there's the community. And it talks about how some of the things that Lauren mentioned with the, you know, historical trauma, you know, the racism, the, you know, systematic 
racism that we've seen throughout history. Then there's a lack of jobs and there's food scarcity with this, the, you know, the lack of the grocery stores, the, the food zones. And there's many types of poverty situations that we are exposed to that some of us really don't have any control over, right? So all of this plays a part as it relates to the environment. So it first starts in within the household, then it trickles down to the community, and then there's an overall impact of the environment and how that is shaped, you know, based on everything. And there's the climate crisis right now, right? There's natural disaster, right? There's wildfire, there's smoke, there's all types, you know, of things going on out outside of our control that is very impactful in how we manage everyday life, right? So this is just an overview of some things to really think about as it relates to, okay, addiction, especially the opioid crisis specifically and how we are managing our daily stresses, you know, life stresses that we have encountered where some of us may not know how to deal with that. So this is just an overview, guys, to look over and just to give an idea, perspective of how ACEs really does impact addiction, specifically um, opioid, opioids that we're talking about today. We can fly to the next slide. <laughs> All right. So from there, we're going to talk about individual risk and protective factors, right? So we talked a little bit about ACEs and how that plays a, a major impact and in, in how, how we, you know, manage our stress. And then while everyone uses a prescription, while anyone who uses, let me, let me stop back, while anyone who uses a prescription opioid can become addictive, there are several risk factors associated with higher rates of misuse, abuse, and addiction. So listed here are some of those risk factors, you know, there's probably there's homelessness, there's pure substance use, and then there are protective factors, right? There's, it's important to consider these risk factors when planning prevention activity, which is why we are listing them today, right? Um, because previous substance use may also warrant a closer look at prescribing those opioids, right? And the alternative treatments. That's why it's so important that we have culturally competent um, healthcare, healthcare providers, right? And mental health professionals that are able to kind of walk us through and prevent, it, you know, addiction or manage, help us manage it. So protective factors over here, of course, spirituality, resilience, you know, that's being able to bounce back. Um, affordable health care um, for many of us, you know, that's a hardship being able to afford health care. It, it's very expensive, right? And inflation is real. So the cost of health care continues, increases and rises. And, you know, a lot of us cannot afford that with some of the, you know, jobs that we have. So just know that Affordable health care is really a protective factor as it relates to the individual risk as it relates to opioid um, use or abuse in the African-American acute community. So here, guys, we have family and community risk factors. So we, we're going to talk about that in the sense of list. There's a list here talks about how those ACEs that I mentioned earlier, domestic violence, right? Absent parent, those are considered ACEs, adverse childhood experiences. Then there's some um, of us who may have been raised by a grandparent or aunt or foster parent. And then some of us may have, or we know someone that has been a part of the juvenile justice system, right? So all of these are ACEs and all of these are family and community risk factors that also plays a part in the opioid crisis that we are facing now. We can, we can slide to the next one. All right, so we, we have risk factors, but we also have protective factors, all right? So as it relates to some of the protective factors here, we're talking about opportunities for positive social involvement. What does that mean? We also talk about recognition for positive behavior, family involvement and parental bonding and support, marriage or committed relationship, healthy beliefs and standards for behaviors. All of those are important um, to our children, right? Whether we want to, um, you know, really, believe that or not, it's, it's important that we are mindful of that. And examples of these things could be anything from a, just having a child that has a stable, consistent adult, right? Or, or a child that has a positive mentor in their life, right? Or a child that has access to a youth center, you know? Or, or the YMCA, 
all these are examples of community protective factors, right? Other community protective factors could be the availability of a faith-based resources, you know? What are some things that the church, you know, resources the church can provide for us? Like, I know a lot of churches in the area, they um, have food um, banks where they give, a lot, give out food to the community when there's, you know, disasters or there's some type of inclement weather or, you know, fire. So what are the, how, what are the resources, protective factors as it relates to their faith-based resources, right? What, what are they doing in the community? as well as after school activities. Do our children have after school activities? And not only we're talking about children, we're also talking about young adults, teenagers. You know, when they graduate from, from high school, what types of support and community protective factors do our students, do our children have once they graduate from high schools? Those things are so important as it relates to the prevention of opioid use, um, misuse or abuse. All right, so we kind of highlighted individual and I'm moving fast, guys. We talked about individual risks and protective factors. We highlighted family and community risk factors. Let's talk a little bit about the environmental risk. If you guys see here, uh, we're talking about some of what Lauren mentioned other, earlier. We're talking about how community laws and norms favor to substance use, right? We're talking about highly accessible and availability of substances. You know, certain areas, it's easy for our teenagers and it's so important, I'm highlighting teenagers because it's so important to know that your teen, teenager, if they're, you know, not to say they are doing it, but they know someone that they can get, you know, a substance from. That's the reality in the world we live in today, right? And the highly accessibility and availability of that substance or any substance, that's a risk factor. That's a problem, right? Um, so just knowing and being aware that, you know, the media pay, plays a role in all of this, you know, the commercials have younger, you know, younger people in the um, younger characters in the commercials and the media portrays it to be, you know, culturally Seagram's is one thing, one thing that I you know, can think of in my head how Seagram's just, you know, culturally they play a part in um, advertising to African-Americans. I just noticed that the last couple of, you know, years is like, okay, Seagram. So just how the media portrayal of alcohol really does impact our community. Um, it makes a difference, right? Um, so low social economic status, all of these are risk, are risk factors, guys. And access to opioids is a primary environmental risk factor associated with the misuse and addiction. That's what this means, right? So an environmental strategy is to limit access to the opioids, right? While keeping them available or appropriate medical uses, right, are necessary to address the risk. So protective factors, that means the prescription drug monitoring programs, right? That means drug disposal programs, we have that with the county. That means peer um, to peer recovery support groups. We will give you guys some resources a little bit later on um, in our workshop on what that looks like and some resources that you have. But there are protective factors um, that we have, guys, that are necessary to address this risk in our community. We can go to the next slide. All right. So as we're talking about access and we're talking about, all right, we talked about the risk factors and protective factors. Let's talk about the continuum of care. How do we address this risk? How do we address this crisis in our community? So there's a three-tier continuum care that I like to highlight, and that is the prevention, intervention, and postvention. Um, um, facets of the continual care. Um, and the first thing you're going to notice here on the screen is that the prevention measures are, you want to know your epidemic, right? You want to know your response, right? So what does that mean? That means that opioid overdose is driven by many different mechanisms. We know that, right? And many of us have different human experiences. Um, so many of us may follow a variety of paths towards the opioid misuse or in overdose. So the realities faced by people who use opioids may be common across regions, but within tight social groups, right? So it's so common. Know who, know your audience, right? Know your response. Know that there is an, an epidemic, right? That there is a problem in your community. And the next step is that to make collaboration with your strategy, right? So effectively responding to the opioid overdose epidemic requires that all parties are at the table. 
that means all hands are on deck, right? That means making collaboration your strategies. We cannot do this alone. Lauren and I, we're just messengers guiding you with the information, but it all takes a team joint effort, right? To ensure that all community entities are able to fulfill their necessary roles and that they're all a part of the process. That's how we unite change, right? That's how change begins. It starts with us. And the next part of the prevention measure will be nothing about us without us. So you know how people make decisions without us sitting at the table. This is not that type of thing, right? That means prevention strategies need to take into full account the realities, the experiences, and the perspectives of those who are at risk of overdose. We're talking about the risk of African-American communities right now and how opioid overdose and abuse and use has really taken over since prior to COVID. It's a drastic increase. So what does that mean? That means that we need to be at that table, having those conversations, being involved in developing those solutions. What does that look like? We're talking about the design, the implementation, and the evaluation of interventions that's going to help those efforts into response of us happening in our community, right? Help us get to the point where we can help ourselves, right? Nothing about us without us. So that means that we also need to be a part of that conversation, right? No one can know you better than you. Right. So being able to sit at that table and have that conversation makes a world of difference. Right. And the next and last thing as far as prevention measures, meet people where they are. Right. Just meet them where they are. That's the guiding principle um, with mostly, in my opinion, anything. That means the more that you're showing compassion. Right. Tolerance, empathy is a big thing to people, not only in crisis, but into general, in, in general, because we all may be going through something, right, that we don't talk about. So just meeting people where they are um, and also acknowledging that all people we meet are different and their behaviors are different and they may change at a different pace or they may be in recovery or they may just be in a space where they don't wanna talk about it, right? So just knowing that you meet people where they are and have compassion and tolerance while the individual that you may know that you suspect you know, have maybe in the crisis and the opioid crisis or use and maybe going through recognizing that these stages help sets reasonable expectations for interacting with, you know, the people you care about that you may suspect um, have an opioid addiction. Um, so yeah, so those are the four prevention measures. All right. Meet people where they are. Remember that. All right. So the next, the next slide talks about overdose prevention, what that, look, that looks like. We talk about enhancing accessibility to care. We kind of mentioned that briefly. You know, like we, we know that opioid use um, and addiction is a medical condition that affects any race, right? Any gender, any income level, or any social class, right? So begin just managing, you know, that we, we want to make sure, and in a perfect world, right, everyone has access to accessibility to care in a perfect world, but that's not the world we live in, right? So just know that um, that's one improvement that we need to strive upon as it relates to overdose, overdose prevention, making sure that everyone has access to that care. The next one talks about reduce high risk prescription drug use. How do we do that? Right. That simply means that there is a dire need of resources for improving communication between healthcare providers and patients. That means that culturally competent um, healthcare provider or that culturally competent mental health provider is necessary, right? Um, and because it gains a deeper understanding, not only for the patient that you're serving, but also for prescribing that opioid to that person who may be experiencing chronic pain, right? So just being sure that that we, we reduce that by having competent medical health providers in our field. Um, and that looks like training, right? You know, training, additional training to help them, you know, get to a better place to be able to really um, accurately and um, which without, you know, there's all types of bias without bias, <laughs> being biased to who they're serving. And we can talk about discrimination. That's a whole nother conversation, but it's so important that we do that, guys. The next thing here, we're talking about increased distribution of and access to, that's that Narcan we talked about earlier. 
is so important. You know, there are several reports on how people may agree with it or not. But one thing is for sure, whether or not you agree with the expanded access to use, you know, it is it does help save lives, right? So that's the more, most important fact is that it's a life-saving drug that can reverse the effects of an overdose right, when administer in time. So just knowing that we need to make sure that we get it out. You know, there's different things in works now that may be, you know, accessible, more accessible to people in the future as it relates to getting that out to everyone, to those who may actually need that, right? And the last thing here talks about increased access to risk reduction store services. We're talking about, that's what I said earlier, all hands on decks. We're raising the awareness. That's what Laura and I are doing today. We're raising the awareness to expand the provision of these prevention, these risk reduction services, as well as prevention education, right? That means that healthcare providers, that means harm reduction organization, that means first responders, police officers, community members, and you and I play a major role in increasing access, right, to risk reduction service. How does that look? We all can play our individual role in making sure that we do our part to reduce um, the risk of the OPO addiction. All right, some intervention programs. We have here, we have education-based programs in Chesterfield. Again, we work for Chesterfield Mental Health um, Support Services. We have a lot of different departments within the agency that specialize in certain aspects of mental health support um, and recovery, substance recovery. So education-based programs are going to discuss some that are in my department, right? So this is coming from my department, and there's many others. Um, for Prevention services in particular, we um, incorporate, implement a lot of education-based programs and their evidence-based programs for most of it. Too Good for Violence is like a 30 to 45 minutes uh, violence prevention program for kindergarten to fifth grade students that focuses on communication, respect of others, but also has um, a, a content session relating sex related to substance use, right? Um, or talks about balance. So we have that, well, that's the education-based programs that we reach in our students, Too Good for Violence in the elementary Rim. There's also SOS, which stands for Science of Suicide, and that is a suicide prevention program that also includes substance use content um, for middle and high school students. So that means that this previous school year, well, not previous, this school year in particular, in the fall of this year, um, our team went into every single middle and high school in the county and we implemented suicide prevention lessons that also had content in there that included substance use, right? Um, talks about alcohol, talks about drugs and how um, youths are affected by that and what we can do to prevent those things. So those are some education-based program, education programs that we use in our department. There's plenty of others. We're talking about with parenting classes. There's APTT. We have active parenting, tweens and teens. I teach that class. And that's how we just help parents kind of, you know, figure out how to best manage behavior concerns for children ages 10 to 15 years old. And again, all of these education-based programs, all of them have a component of substance use to kind of bridge and gain that awareness of what to look out when it comes to substance abuse, right? How to prevent substance use, how to, you know, gain and bring bridge that awareness to our youth so that they are aware of how to handle it if it, they ever come across, you know, and cross substance use or across, across the availability of it, if that makes sense. Um, so there's adult mental health first aid, there's youth mental health first aid. I teach that as well. It talks about that's a seven and a half hour certification course um, that helps adults recognize signs and symptoms of mental health challenges in other adults. We have one for adults as well as youths. If you're interested in that, you guys can always contact me uh, for more information. Then there's different partnerships with other local health departments and substance abuse community. Then there's CAS, as I think Lauren mentioned earlier, there's, SD, there's S, uh, SDA, which stands for Same Day Access, and that's the initial point of contact 
for information services requests for mental health services and substance use, right? So that's the official um, mental health alcohol treatment services for Chesterfield County. It's called Same Day Access. And then CAST is to help young people with mental health and substance use issues. So those are some partnerships that um, my Department for Prevention Services, we um, collab a lot, partner a lot with those um, agents, those departments to kind of support individuals when needed. Um, so that's some intervention programs um, for you guys at a highlight. If you want to know more, please uh, reach out to either Lauren or myself. And last but not least, guys, is a prevention uh, postvention resources. Again, that same day access line recovery resources here, same day access line. That's the telephone number there. Um, uh, Lauren, do you want to highlight some of this, a lot of this information? Sure, I can do that. Okay. So right. there are many, um, if, if you're looking for recovery resources or if you're looking for treatment resources for yourself or someone you know, we certainly cannot put together one slide because there are so many and it's really important that we find the right fit for folks. But just to highlight a couple, we do of course provide services here. And then a, a live RVA is a warm line. So if someone is struggling and they wanna to talk to somebody who's in recovery, someone with lived experience similar to theirs, they can call this number from 8 a.m. to 12 midnight and someone will answer and help them, help them talk through things or help them find a resource or help them find a, a, a meeting or um, a, an inpatient program. They can, they can provide a lot of, of, of help for folks. We have a Friends for Recovery program here in Chesterfield. It's a drop-in center essentially. So if somebody in recovery wants to be with other people in recovery and do recreational, um, uh, you know, engage in playing with games or, or just talking about things or do some groups, uh, it's both, um, community and recreation. So I think that's a great uh, uh, thing for folks. If you're looking for that, let me know. Of course, there are community NA and AA meetings, smart recovery meetings. These are all great things for folks in recovery. Recovery Dharma is also great for folks and they have, an, um, they have meetings that are specifically just for people of color. And for family and friends, there are lots of resources available. Um, it can be very isolating to love someone who uses drugs or love someone who's in uh, recovery. It, can, it just feels like you need to talk to people who have the same experience as you. North Star Community is here in Chesterfield. Um, that is Christian-based, um, but they run a lot of great programs out. And I don't believe that you have to engage in any kind of church services, but it is Christian-based. Smart Recovery is, um, is similar to NA and AA, but they do have a friends and family program. It can be very helpful for people when they're learning to um, set boundaries and engage with uh, in, in, in compassionate responses to their family or friends who are using drugs. And Families Anonymous operates in Chester, operates across the nation. But we have two meetings here in Chesterfield, uh, kind of one on each end of the county. And if you're interested in that, of course you can reach out and I'm happy to connect you with the folks who run those meetings. Um, really, if you're looking for something, reach out and, and I will try to find it for you or for your family member. Um, like, you know, like I said at the top of it, there's so much, we just couldn't fit it all on one side. There are treatment centers. There are places where folks can access medications like methadone and suboxone. There are all kinds of different options for people these days. And we would love to help you, uh, you or someone you love or care for find the right fit. Okay, a lot of information there. I, I really enjoyed that and felt like I learned a lot and really gave me a better idea of how connected all of these things are. You know, it's not just a, the uh, opioid epidemic is not just a one problem. It shows that the entire system ha has a problem as far as our churches losing respectability and less people going to, you know, spending time with one another. It, it's a real issue. One of the things I was curious about is, I think it's popular to say that the opioid epidemic has brought um, attention because it is a, in a lot of ways, it is a problem for, for white people or white people have certainly had a problem with it. Can, have you seen an increase? I know politicians talk more about it, when you, especially when you compare to the 80s with the crack epidemic, they're much more polite in the way they talk about it. They talk about it with more sympathy. Can you actually see all this political talk actually turning into something useful as far as more resources for the mental health services industry or more resources for people to actually get help? Or does it seem like it's just a bunch of political speaking? Yes, there, there are certainly more 
there's more access to resources and there's more money at least coming down the pike because you know we're seeing a lot of these um pharmaceutical companies who peddled these opioids initially as prescriptions that were safe and non-habit forming which we know is not true having to kind of pay the bill they will never ever be able to pay us enough to you know <laughs> undo all of the harm and and pain that they've caused folks but this money is starting to trickle down into the state. We do have an opioid abatement group, and those folks are the ones that are going to start making some decisions about, hey, what are we going to do with this? You know, and I'm making up a number. What are we going to do with this $200 million we got from the settlement? And what are we going to do with the next $200 million increment that's going to come? So there are, there are definitely more resources. There are definitely more clinics. There are definitely more places where folks can access care. Is it equally distributed in every neighborhood? No. And that's where we run into trouble, right? But is it more available? Mm -hmm. And of course, with the expansion of Medicaid here in the state, that has definitely made, um, you know, it, it's easier to access services. Of course, you have to be able to apply for Medicaid and that can be really a challenge for folks. So, so the, the short answer is yes, the longer answer is for many people, but not for all people, um, it is easier to access treatment and care. That's a great point. Valerie, one of the things you talked about is and this might not be a question you all can answer, but you talked about your children are being exposed to this stuff. You're, you know, if you have a teenager, maybe they don't know, but they probably know someone who knows someone who can actually access these substances. How, as a parent, do we confront this reality without scaring the child? Or, you know, I won't even know where to begin with like having that conversation with your with your teenager, like the can you offer any kind of guidance or advice about how to go about doing this? Yes, that's actually one of the questions. I have a positive parenting tip here. That was one of the uh, the questions, the answer that we want to provide. Um, definitely one positive, or here's their four steps here when it equates to the parenting tips. The first thing is to just be empathetic, right? Just starts with the soft tone. A lot of us as parents, we just go into it you know, let's just talk about it. Sometimes these conversations are so sensitive. You want to create that safe space, um, that safe environment for your children to establish that open, um, honest, effective communication with your with your 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 children. So your child. So start off real soft and be open to listen. Just ask questions, right? Ask them questions. So you know, have you heard about, for example, would you say, um, what do you know about? opioids, right? Just start the casual conversation and allow them to express to you what they know. And then, you know, you can go above that and say, okay, once they give you the information that you're seeking for, then you build upon the conversation from there. So if they say, well, I really don't know much about it, that's when you can educate them, right? Educate them on the awareness of what it is, what it looks, what to look out for, right? Um, and send a clear message to your child through conversation um, that, that you want to make sure that they are okay. You want to make sure um, that they're safe at all times. You want to make sure um, that if they are exposed to it, or if they have, you know, used it or tried it or experiment with them with it, that you have that conversation of your concern for them to say, hey, you know, maybe that's not the best way to go. How can we, you know, move forward? How can we improve this decision? How can we do something differently next time? Um, if you were, you know, you know, offered this drug, right? So just notice, you know, changes of behaviors, you know, if they're not as open, because in the perfect world, we want our children to be open and honest with us, but sometimes that's not the case, right? So we have to be, we have to be prepared for what we're gonna hear. So if you are, if you open up that conversation, don't freak out when you get, you know, answers that you may not be expecting because of all you want your child to be honest with you. Above all, you want your child to be open and honest um, and just pay attention to their behavior. If they're not honest, pay attention to their behavior, you know, pay attention to their appearance, uh, pay attention to how they're talking, pay attention to their friends. Who are they hanging around, right? So just observe your child and then, you know, build upon that. And then let's see here, there's talking points. So there's five conversation goals here from SAMHSA. There's there's talk, they, it says talk, they hear you. SAMHSA has a lot of good tips. There's drugpolicy.org that has eight tips. And then there's why teen use drugs. So those are all links 
that you can visit there to kind of give you that conversational piece um, when talking to your children that will make you make it guide and make it easier for you to have that difficult conversation. That's good advice. Yeah, and, and I imagine very difficult advice to actually to do, but it, it's certainly uh, needed to be said. So I appreciate that. I, I know some of you filled out the survey that we put out to uh, off before we offered this program, and we did get I uh, know someone from law enforcement saying that like eighty percent, ninety percent of their job uh, goes around uh, opioid addiction and the issues that arise from opioid addiction. How are you all seeing? Like, is this a problem that can be, in, this is not a problem that can be policed. This has, this has, we have to get to the root of the problem, which is mental health. But I can't help but feel like the, the police, the law enforcement, they're, they're kind of in a no-win situation too. It seems like a very difficult situation for, for everybody, which I know is not a question, but I just, I really don't know what can be done about, about that. You're right. It is very difficult, and we we certainly will never police our way out of this this epidemic, right? It really is going to be about prevention and treatment. And unfortunately, we've we've up for a hundred years, we have arrested people who use drugs and really only made our problem worse. So it is time to sort of refocus our efforts, think about different ways, and move this more into the public health realm and out of the you know out of the legal system. It, it's unfair to ask police officers really to be out there. Uh, trying to trying to police this, you know, we cannot arrest our way out of this. If you arrest a drug dealer, three more will pop up who want that person's place, right? We have to win it on the supply side or on the demand side, right? We have to we have to win it on that prevention and treatment side. It's going to take some time, and it's going to take us reallocating some resources in a different way and thinking about the way that um, you know can we can we have if we're going to have police officers out there. Can they be responsible more for diverting folks to a treatment center and offering that kind of service? Um, can we get social workers out there to ride alongs? We do have a program here in Chesterfield in, in um, partnership with the Sarah Center where there is a, a peer recovery specialist, so somebody with lived experience with addiction and mental health that is available to the police that just started recently. And so the police can call them out and, and ask them to you know, meet with somebody that they come across to talk to them about recovery resources or treatment resources. So the police are open and willing to try new things. We just have to figure out how we can best partner with them and how to really, you know, take this responsibility off their plate, a responsibility that really should have never been um, on their plates in the, in the, in, to get go. We really should have, uh, you know, if we could go back in time and treat this as a public health issue, uh, we'd be in a, a completely different space. Sorry, that's a, that's a great point. Um, Let's see, we, we still have some time for a couple of other questions. Um, let me see here. I know from our survey, I think you all did a great job answering some of the questions that we had and just making it clear that this is a bigger issue than and how can we destigmatize this problem? You know, I think Lauren, you made a good point that this is not something you can just wheel yourself into, um, into it to getting better. You need the whole community really to help you uh, to, to rise up over this challenge. And uh, that's really gonna be a big issue because here in America, it seems like we're all about make it on your own and do it yourself and toughen up. But we really can't have that approach. We wouldn't have that approach with someone with, a, with cancer or something like that. So why do we have this sort of attitude with, with the disease? I mean, I'm sure you all have, have dealt with this in some of the conversations you've had. How do you go about trying to destigmatize a, this issue with, with, with people who may be going through it? Or maybe even, even the self-loathing, you know, if they feel bad and they're down on themselves, how do you try to get them to turn that attitude around maybe? Yeah, that's, that's great. So I think it really is all about conversation. The more conversation and the more um, information we provide to people, you know, when we can explain that substance use disorder is a chronic relapsing brain disorder that needs long-term care, just like other chronic relapsing health conditions like high blood pressure and diabetes and asthma, that, you know, we, we have treatments that are good and we have a lot of resources that are available for folks and when we can just keep 
getting that messaging out to folks that, you know, if, if you find yourself in this position, there, there's no shame. This can happen to anybody. <laughs> this can happen to anybody. There are things that can make you more at risk, but anybody can develop a substance use disorder over time. And so it's really important that we just keep talking about it. It's this, um, you know, there's a, there's a phrase, it's, it's sort of flip, right, to say, but, but secrets make us sick. And so when we don't talk about this problem, more and more people get sick. And the more we talk about it and the more we make it just part of conversation, the better off we're all going to be. And you're right, that, that sort of rugged individualism that we have in the United States, while that may be good for some things, it's not good for community. We know we all do best when we, when we have community around us who love us, who care about us, and who want the best for us. That's when we do best. That's, that's well said. And I will say that uh, that it has been an hour now. It's eight o'clock. So that's all we can keep you all here for. I, I really appreciate the, the information. Again, this may be not like, the most fun topic, but I think it's an important topic and it's not something that's going away. So I really appreciate you both. Well, thank you for having us today. I, I hope that if you're here in the call that you will reach out to us if you have any questions or if you're looking for a resource, we put our information in the chat and we put our information here on this slide. Uh, we can make these slides available to the library if they'd like them um, so that you have them. And um, you know, we also put some information about Narcan in the chat. And so there's some videos there. If you watch those videos, you can get some information at the end of the videos about how to get your Narcan. And so uh, please feel free to share that with anybody and to just keep pressing this messaging along. We're so grateful that you uh, came and, uh, and stayed with us today. Yeah.